1.3 maximum or minimum of a quadratic function. This brings up a lot of review from grade 10. Uh, all that quadratic stuff. And so first we're just going to review what quadratic functions can look like. Uh, the three possible options for the name of the form are factored, standard, and vertex. What is this guy? There's a hint. This is probably the easiest one to remember. Uh, no? no? This is the one you spent a lot of time with. This guy is standard. Okay, anytime you see something in order like a, b, c, and x squared, then x to the power of 1, then x to the power of 0, this is standard. This guy over here has factors, right? It's a times this group times this group. Anytime you multiply something together, the things that you multiply together to get the product are called factors. So this is factor times factor times factor equals product. So this is factored form, which leaves this as vertex form. Well, we'll get into why they're called what they're called, but first let's just give an example of each. Um, an example of something in standard form. It can be as simple or as complicated as you'd like, but I don't want to do just the easiest thing. So we'll just write y equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 6. It's just an example of a quadratic written in standard form. It has coefficient for the x squared term, coefficient for the x term, and a constant of positive 6. Vertex form, same thing. Remember, it's always a relationship between y and x. So we're going to have a y always, and we're always going to have an x. But the other parameters, in this case a, h, and k, are going to change. I'll make this one a little more complicated so we can talk about it. Negative 1 half, and then in brackets, x minus 2, close bracket, squared, plus 4. And again, over here in factored form, it still needs to be a relationship between y and x. So you're going to have a y on the left, and your x is on the right. And let's do 3, x plus 1, x minus 4. You could have picked any other examples that you wanted in the whole world, and this would work out just fine. Well, what are we learning from each type of equation. Um, you can pick up information from any one of them, but can you remember anything specific? They all have an A in them, and A does the same thing in every equation. So A gives, and we're not going to get too specific here, but A gives the vertical stretch compression. So uh, write small because you're going to write a couple things in each of these boxes. Vert stretch slash comp. Well, I see that A in all of them. So I'm just going to go across here. Vertical stretch compress and vertical stretch compress. Okay, well A told us the vertical stretch compression, but does A tell us anything else? If it opens up or down, right? The sign tells us if it opens up or down. Opens up slash down and that's in all of them, right? A tells us that. Okay, now we're done with A. 
But there is one more thing that standard form is really helpful in doing. And you actually asked a question about it earlier today already. But it's basically what happens when x is 0. We get the y-intercept. Well, if x is 0, this whole term becomes 0. This whole term becomes 0. And all we're left with is y equals c. So standard form actually tells us the y-intercept. You just have to look at the constant. And that is the y-intercept. That's not true of any of the other uh, forms. OK. Let's skip over to factored form. It has an a in it, but it also has these two factors. What do they tell us? Kind of did it a little bit when we were talking about homework problems. And I drew a couple graphs for you. they will give you the x-intercepts. And that's all he does. You can also then get the vertex from that, right? If you know the two x-intercepts, uh, the vertex, because the parabola is symmetrical, the x-coordinate of the vertex is going to be right in between these two and then to find the y you just sub it back in and you find out what y is but it doesn't come directly from the equation we're just writing down the information that comes without doing any math there it is okay uh, vertex form what does it tell you the vertex okay we're not going to call it the vertex here because we're going to write that in the next box but basically if the vertex has isn't at zero zero and it's maybe moved a little bit down and moved a little bit over what are those moves called? Start with a T. Translation. Okay. Oh, he's, what did you say? I just, I just assumed you got it right. Okay. So this is going to tell us the horizontal, horiz, translation, and the vertical, translation. So they're not changing the shape at all. They're just moving where it is, okay? Now we'll go through, and uh, we already kind of did this, but what is the point that we can get just from looking at standard form? We already wrote it. We'll write it again. It's the y-intercept, okay? The y-intercept is a point on the function, on the curve. Uh, and when we're talking about quadratics, it will always, always, always have a y-intercept. What about over here? vertex form gives us the vertex and factored form gives us the if there are it's not always x-intercepts right there might be one there might be two there might be zero and all of these things can be represented by coordinates because that's how we place things on a graph so uh, what is the what are the coordinates of the y-intercept for this specific example. Yeah, but we need two points. So we need an x and a y. Hint is the y-intercept occurs where x is 0. So x is 0, y is 6, that's the y-intercept. So you don't know much about this thing, but you know that it crosses right there. Okay. What about uh, the vertex of the example in our second column? We don't need to worry about A. He doesn't tell us anything about the vertex. But this does. And this is the, the tricky part. It's x minus h, x minus 2. So the vertex here, I'm just going to write, is h, k. So for our specific example, h is 2, because it's x minus h minus 2, no sign change there, so h is 2, and k is 4, which means this thing has moved to the right 2 and up 4, and then it has a, a shape. Okay. Uh, x intercepts over here in this example. Negative 
Good. So if we were writing just the x-intercepts, you'd usually write it like this. x equals negative 1, x equals 4. We're writing the coordinates of those points. Okay, so because they're the x-intercepts, it's where we cross the x-axis. It's the x that has a value, and it's where y is 0, right? Along that whole x-axis, y is 0. The value of the function is 0 along this whole line. Good. All right, to summarize what we just did. So from the standard equation f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Uh, what do we learn? What important point can we learn about? It's just a review of the chart that we did up above. y-intercept, it's right there. What's the value of that y-intercept? c. Just the constant of our standard equation. Okay? Then we have our vertex form. What key point comes from there? Vertex. What's the coordinates? HK. And then we have our buddy in factored form. which is a x minus r x minus s and what key information comes there it's our x intercepts which are simply r and s if you memorize that you will go a long way in quadratics Okay, on page 14 you have an investigation. It says consider the graphs below. What do you notice? The two graphs. How would you compare those two pictures? <laughs> they are the same. So you're telling me there are two equations that look totally different, but they make the exact same graph? Yep, they sure do. All right, what does this tell us about their equations? I think I just answered that one. They form the same graph. They result in the same graph. They model. They model the same graph. There we go. They model the same graph. Okay, so they're the same, but they're different. And we want to be able to bounce back and forth between what form is the first picture in? Vertex form. And the second picture? Standard, where A is 1 in both cases. So what do we have to do to go from vertex form to standard form? Well, we have to simply expand and simplify. We expand and simplify. Well, what does that look like? We take what we have in vertex form, and which is f of x bracket x plus 2 squared plus 3, and we're just going to bed mass this thing. Hopefully we're experts in bed mass. I'm going to write it up here so that I can refer to it as I move along. Got to deal with brackets first. I have a variable plus a constant. I can't simplify that any further. So brackets are done. Uh, exponent, deal with my exponent. x plus 2 squared if we remember our patterns again from what we've learned previously, then I know that this x plus 2 squared 
becomes x squared plus 4x plus 4. And over here I still have plus 3. That's expanded, and now I can simplify by grouping like terms. x squared plus 4x plus 7. And if I've done it right, I should have the exact same equation that I had on the other side, which I do. That's not too challenging, but how do we go from standard to vertex? What's that strategy called? Grade 10, lesson 6.1. Completing the square. Completing the square. Okay, so I'll go through it um, fairly quickly, and then we're going to actually do another one where I'll take the full notes, okay? So here we go. We've got, uh, and this is a pretty easy one, so don't use this one for your main reference, but it will give you a pretty good idea of how to do it. So we've got x squared plus 4x plus 7, and we know down at the bottom we want it to look like x plus 2 squared plus 3. Okay? First thing we're going to do, group our x terms. Leave the positive 7 out. What we want is for whatever is in this bracket to become a perfect square trinomial because I know that I can uh, if I have it in the form of a perfect square trinomial which has that basic form then I can represent it as a binomial squared. So in order to do that I need to take half of B and square it. I'm going to add that to inside the brackets so I'm going to copy down what I have already. I'm not going to change anything. Leave x squared plus 4x there. But now I need half of b and square it. So I take half of b, which is 4, divided by 2 is 2. And then square it. I'm going to add 2 squared. Okay? But now I've changed something. I've changed the value completely by adding that. So if I'm going to add that, I also need to subtract that. You say, well, you didn't do anything. You just added 0. And that's true. But it's because I need this guy in the brackets to complete my perfect square trinomial. I don't need this guy who has a value of negative 4. So I'm actually going to kick him out of my brackets. Copy down what I have. x squared plus 4x plus 2 squared. Close that bracket off. And I'm going to have now negative 4 outside the bracket with my positive 7. Now, inside my bracket, I created a perfect squared trinomial, so I know that I can represent it as a binomial squared. And I didn't write this last term as plus 4, because I wanted to see really easily that I have right here a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, where a is x and b is 2. So now I can rewrite this as x plus 2 squared and negative 4 plus 7 is positive 3. I know I did it right because it's the same as the vertex form that I had over there. Okay, that's a pretty easy example. We'll write down the step-by-steps in the next one. Okay, example 1 says find the vertex of each function by completing the square and then answer is the vertex a minimum or a maximum. So again, to complete the square, our first step is to group our terms with an x. Group terms with an x. Then what we want to do is take half of b and square it. So we're going to add half of b I guess half of b squared. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Half of b squared to 
complete perfect square trinomial. All right, this is a little bit more challenging because uh, b is an odd number, right? So we're going to end up here with copying what we have, x squared plus 5x, and now we're going to take half of b, which I'm just going to leave as 5 over 2, right? 5 cut in half is half of 5, and we're going to add it. And now in our next step, which I'm going to do, I'll write it in a second, but we're also going to subtract it because we don't actually want to change the value of this thing. And we still have, sorry, I'll close the bracket. And then we have our plus seven out here. Add half of b squared to complete the perfect square trinomial. Subtract the same amount. Subtract the same amount. So you don't change the value of the function, or I guess that you don't change the function. Let's just do that, so you don't change the function. Okay. So now I can move this uh, negative half of 5 squared out of the brackets. And I can do that easily because there's no multiple out here. There's no coefficient. So I'm just going to be left with my perfect square trinomial inside my brackets, which was x squared plus 5x plus 5 over 2 squared. Close that bracket. And on the outside, I have this plus 7 still. Uh, but I also have minus 5 over 2 squared. And from here, we just simplify. Or I guess there is one more step. We're going to rewrite write the perfect square trinomial as a binomial squared. And then we're also going to do and simplify. Okay. Again, we didn't actually, in order to do this, this would be 25 over 4, right? If we squared this fraction, it'd be 25 over 4. Inside your brackets, it doesn't make sense to do that because you want a squared plus 2ab plus b squared so that you can simply write it as x plus 5 over 2 squared. But on the outside, we do want it as uh, negative 25 over 4 negative 25 over 4, and we are adding 7, but this time I'm not just going to write 7 this way, I'm going to write it as a fraction over 4, so that I can add my constants at the end. So 7 as a fraction over 4 is 28 over 4, that's the same value as 7, and then we can rewrite. Negative 25 quarters plus 28 quarters is positive 3 fourths, positive 3 quarters, which then tells us that the vertex is at, and be careful, negative 5 halves, positive 3 fourths. Okay, uh, we've got the vertex. Uh, which way does this thing open?
Opens up. Why? Yeah. Coefficient A is positive. Positive. In B, we have a little bit of a harder example. It's going to follow the same steps, but there's one extra step at the beginning. We notice that there's a coefficient in front of the x squared term that is not 1. It's negative 2 thirds. So we have to, when we group our terms with x in it, we need to first factor out the coefficient of the x squared term. Factor out the coefficient of the x squared term. So, uh, if we're going to factor that out, we've got negative 2 thirds on the outside. Now factoring that out of the first term is easy, we're just going to be left with x squared. It's a little bit more difficult to factor out of the next term. Uh, we have, we're going to factor out of this 8. So 8 divided by 2 thirds. 8 divided by negative 2 thirds. So I know it's going to be a negative. But 8 divided by 2 thirds is the same as 8 times 3 over 2. So if I do 8 times 3, I get 28. Divided by 2 is 12. And I'm not factoring out the x. It's not finding the greatest common factor. I'm just factoring out the coefficient. Okay, so the x terms are still in there. What's that going to allow me to do? It's going to allow us to complete the square, end up with a perfect square trinomial uh, that we can convert into a binomial squared and be in vertex form. So here we go. Mianju, after writing x squared minus 12x, what do I need to do? Nice, take half of b and square it. So b is negative 12. I'm going to add, and then in brackets, negative 6 squared. If I add that value, I also need to subtract that value squared. Now, you're saying, Mr. V, a squared number is always positive. So negative 6 times negative 6 is the same as 6 times 6. So why would I need to remember that negative sign? Well, what it's going to do is make it really easy in your next step to convert into a binomial squared because you know that the value of a is x and the value of b is going to be negative 6, not positive 6. Yeah? That's why it's helpful. So out here we still have plus 5. Now, another tricky step that was not in our last scenario is that this guy I want to kick him out of the brackets. And before, we would have just taken negative 36 and moved it to the outside. But now, it doesn't actually just have the value of negative 36. It has a value of negative 36 times negative 2 thirds. As long as he's stuck in this group, uh, with the whole group is being multiplied by negative 2 thirds. So if I'm going to take him out of that group, I have to compensate for that. So I'll start by rewriting what I have x squared minus 12x plus negative 6 squared. And maybe I'll just go one step further and I'll write this as negative 36 instead of negative 6 squared. And now to remove it from the brackets, I'm going to rewrite what I have. Negative 2 thirds, open bracket, x squared minus 12x plus negative 6 squared. I'm going to close that bracket, but in order to do that I need to multiply negative 36 times negative 2 thirds. So I can do that in two ways. I can multiply it by 2 and then divide by 3, or I could divide by 3 and then multiply by 2, which seems easier to me. So I'm going to get 36 divided by 3, which is 12, times 2, which is 24, and now I have to decide if it's positive or negative. Well, I've got a negative times a negative, so that's going to be positive. In my last step, I'm going to do two things. Number one is convert this perfect square trinomial 
into a squared binomial and combine my constant into positive 29. This tells me the vertex is at 6, 29. And does it open up or down? Yeah, the coefficient of a right from the beginning, uh, the coefficient of the x squared term a is negative, negative all the way through, so it opens down. Which means that this vertex is a maximum value. And a would have been a minimum value in the previous example. Okay, example three says to solve a problem involving a max or a min. So we have Rachel and Ken. They are knitting scarves to sell at the craft show. The wool for each scarf costs six bucks. I'm just going to jot down information as I go. They were planning to sell the scarves for ten dollars. So cost, uh, price, ten dollars the same as last year when they sold 40 scarves. However, they know that if they raise the price, they could make more profit. They've been told that for every 50 cent increase, uh, they can expect to sell four fewer scarves. Okay. Let's think about what we have here. This can go here. I've got my information kind of lined up. The price is going to go up 50 cents each, and the number of scarves is going to go down by four for every increment that they move up of 50 cents. So we're going to introduce a variable here. We're going to let x be the number of 50 cent increases. And we need a formula for profit. So profit typically equals, does equal, the profit per scarf times the number of scarves. Is it scarves? Scarfs. Um, plural of scarf. I'm going to go with scarfs. You sure? I'm going to trust you on that one. The number of scarves sold. Okay, well, what was the profit on each scarf last year? If it cost them six bucks to make, they sold it for ten bucks, the profit was four dollars. Okay, so this is last year. You can put a little last year. This isn't what we're worrying about this year, but anyway. Four dollars per scarf, forty scarves. Okay? What about this year? Well, let's use our variable x, which is our number of 50 cent increases, so we're talking about the profit with respect to those increases. Last year they made four dollars a scarf. This year they're going to make 50 cents more per scarf every time every 50 cent increase. So we actually have four plus 0 0.5 times the number of increases. 0 0.5x. And for the number of scarves sold, last year they had 40, and this year they're going to lose 4 every price increase. Well, now we can, what, by the way, what form are we in? Standard factored vertex? Factored form, right? That's multiplication, there's two factors. 
but we can simplify this and get it back into standard form. From there, we can get it into vertex form, which will tell us what is the maximum profit that they'll make and uh, how many price increases they need to make to get there. Okay, FOIL, first times first, outside times outside, inside times inside, last times last. Rearrange this so that it looks like standard form. Group my like terms. I have negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 160. Now I have two options. I can complete the square to find the vertex, or I can use partial factoring. I'm going to complete the square first by grouping my x terms, then by factoring out the coefficient of the x squared term, which leaves us with negative 2, and then in brackets, x squared minus 2x on the outside plus 160. Now I'm going to complete the square by taking half of b and squaring it. So half of b is negative 1, and I'm going to square that. Because I added that value, I know negative 1 squared is just positive 1, so I'm adding 1, I'm also going to subtract 1. Now, I don't need that for the perfect square trinomial, I only need what's here. But as I kick that out of the brackets, I need to remember that it is currently being multiplied by negative 2. So its value outside of the bracket is actually positive 2. And inside the bracket, this reduces to x minus 1 squared. Reduce my constant on the outside of the bracket. Copy down what I have. Okay. Now, what does that tell me? That tells me their maximum profit is going to be $162 at the craft show. And it's going to happen if they increase the price by one increment of 50 cents. Okay? To maximize profit, they should raise the price to $10.50 per scarf. Profit will be $162. Example four is essentially the same thing, just using technology. We would have done it on Desmos uh, drawn a little sketch. Essentially, you just type that function that's there into Desmos and click on the important information, whether that's the vertex or the x-intercepts, whatever it is, and your practice problems are there on the bottom, page 31. Thanks for sticking with it.